extension is the nothing personal word of the day for Tuesday, January 10th, 2023, extension. Not like an extension cord, not like I'm giving you an extension on your rent payments, on your credit card. An extension is when you have an employee under contract and you extend their contract often prematurely. Extending a contract that has run out, that's a new contract. I always viewed it very simply. If we have a player who has any number of years of control left with us and we sign him to a contract that locks him in for any number of years where we wouldn't otherwise have him, that's an extension. If you have a player signed to a three-year deal and at the end of year three, you sign him to another three-year deal, that's not an extension. They've re-signed him. If he's in year two of the three-year deal and you sign him for an additional three years, that's a contract extension. The thing about contract extensions is that more often than not, you're gonna get screwed. And the reason you're gonna get screwed is that you sign players to extensions or coaches or GMs or presidents. You do it when you are irrationally exuberant about something that just took place. Michael Bidwell is the owner of the Cardinals football team, not St. Louis Cardinals. He has Kyler Murray as quarterback, loves him, thinks it's great. They go 11 and six last season, everyone's excited. They have the hip coach, Cliff Kingsbury. They have a good GM, great team. They lost to the Rams in last year's playoffs, the eventual Super Bowl champions, but they said, we're on our way. We've got this. Guess where Kyler Murray was going after last season? Wait for it, nowhere. What about Cliff Kingsbury? Coach, where was he going? Nowhere. However, as players are taught and coaches are taught, this is like page one of the playbook. When your owner is super happy about something that just happened, even when you think it's not sustainable, even when you think it was lucky that it happened or it had nothing to do with you, the fact that it did happen, go to your owner, go to your president and say, hey, how about the C word? The C word is a word that we use all the time in sports, not what you think. Continuity. Continuity is our favorite C word because we think that C leads to W. We're always taught that in school. Continuity leads to winning. Keep the team together. Don't trade this guy, bring him back. Keep this going. When you win a World Series, bring them all back. Let's run it back is another expression people use. That's another expression for continuity. We would get studies given to us by MLB showing the turnover that all teams have, that your specific fan base who's crying for continuity, they don't know what they're talking about. They don't realize that there's a lack of continuity across all teams in all sports, whether they're good or bad. Oh, but the Yankees had the core four. Core four is not the C word of continuity. It's good that they had the four of them together, Pettit and Jeter and Posada and somebody else, Rivera. There's turnover. But when something good happens, you have this urge inside you to keep it going. It's always going to be this good. Aaron Judge hit 62 home runs. He's going to do it again and again and again for a decade. So the Cardinals go in and they say, hey, Kyler, we're going to make you happy. I promise. I know that, you know, under you, we've missed the playoffs, but now we're, we're on our way. You know, we made the playoffs finally. They missed it in 19, they missed it in 20, they made it in 21. And the view was, let's keep the band together. Let's do this level of continuity. Let's give out these big deals. So guess what they did? They signed Kyler Murray to the third richest contract for a, a quarterback behind that guy in Cleveland and behind Russell Wilson in Denver. And then they looked at their coach and said, we love you so much and you got so much good attention during the draft when you were sitting in your home. We want you to stay in that home. We want you to stay so good looking and lying there because we're getting a lot of marketing dollars and you're hip and you're cool. This is amazing. We're gonna extend you through 2027 season. We're gonna pay you until 2028. And this is the core that's gonna win a Super Bowl. Our first ever. So they go through 2022 and they were four and 13 this year. 
Is that a blip? Is that a bump? Is that the rule? Was the exception 2021 when they made the playoffs? Are there personnel issues? Are there coaching issues? Are there quarterback health issues? Guess what? None of it matters because the Cardinals fired Cliff Kingsbury. Fired him right after the NFL tells all owners, listen, you are signing these coaches for years and years and years. You're extending them for no particular reason and then you're canning them. For what? Stop doing that. Now, why don't owners listen to the NFL? The same reason we didn't listen to Bud Selig or Rob Manford. Because we all suffer from the same disease and that's the disease of me. The disease of me is a disease that says, I'm always right, they're always wrong. What happens to them will not happen to me. Anything that happened in the past is not in any way an indicator of what will happen in the future. I grew up like that on Wall Street. Every, have you ever opened your bank statement? Ever opened an investment statement? That's the number one line you'll always read. Past performance is not indicative of future result. It's right there in front of us. But in sports, we read it as following. Past performance guarantees future result. Those are two totally opposite things. How can they both be true? Past performance does not indicate future result. That sounds normal, that sounds right. But in sports, we say it's the opposite. Past performance will guarantee future winning, rings, ego, parades, all the great things. And if it doesn't happen, boom, we switch course. So Cliff Kingsbury's out in Arizona. And the question is, what do they do now? Do they go back? Are they gonna hire a college, someone from college? Are they gonna hire a retread from the professionals? Are they gonna upgrade a defensive coordinator, offensive coordinator? All of a sudden the Cardinals are gonna bring him in. There's gonna be a press conference. Kyler Murray's gonna be all happy and they're gonna say, look, we are on the road to success. They already leaked out that Kyler Murray's gonna have a say in the next coach. Spoiler alert, bad idea. Anytime you give a player the power to get rid of a coach, I'm talking to you in Atlanta, Trey Young and Nate McMillan, anytime you give a player that power, I'm talking to you, LeBron, how's it working in LA, good? Are you happy with LA? Anytime you give a player the power to get involved in anything executive management related, you are going to lose, period. I don't put players on a team and say, you know what? I'm gonna pinch hit today. I've got an idea, start me at shortstop. Now, don't get me wrong, I like shagging balls during BP, but a game where it matters, let them do their job. Hey, I'm really happy to hire a CFO, but I'm gonna take care of the audit this year. What? No, you let them do their job. Players need to play. Owners need to have the understanding that once in a while there will be a blip and you've got to know when it's the exception, when it's the rule, and the Cardinals don't know the difference. And when you don't know the difference, you do what they're doing now. You fire your coach, you fire your GM, don't listen to the crap. Oh, the GM resigned, citing health concerns. Horse hockey. They believe they're so embarrassed over their performance that they are starting over brand new with Kyler Murray people in positions of GM and coach, and they're gonna let him play and then hopefully win. NGTH, not going to happen. Kyler Murray having to say in the next coach, give me a break. When you have a plan, the best teams, look at the best organizations. Let's talk about the Patriots. Talk about the Dodgers, talk about the Yankees, talk about the Rays, talk about the Guardians, talk about the San Antonio Spurs. I'll give you examples in all sports, here I go. What do they have in common? They do not suffer from the disease of recency. The disease of recency, which is a distant cousin of the disease of me, says anything that's going on now must be real. Anything that went on before obviously was a mirage. Can you imagine running a team where you change the direction of your team each year? Who would ever do that? <laughs> yeah, this guy here. It's true, Coca. It was so different when I was running a team. It was, it was amazing. We would have a plan in place and then we'd give up when it didn't happen. 
And I would always say the reason was money. We didn't have enough money, which was true. We didn't have the money to see the plan through. But if the plan had worked and we won more games quickly, why don't we just admit that in the beginning? Hey, we've got a plan we're putting in place, but it's got a year. If it doesn't work in a year, we're switching course. I always used to talk to our baseball people about sailboats. So when sailboats, have you ever seen a sailboat, right? It's called a tack. It means, and this is not some sort of flex wearing LL Bean clothes. I'm talking about when you've got, you're charting a course. When you're charting a course in a sailboat, sometimes you're in irons. Irons is when the sail is flipping and you're not going anywhere, right? You have to be going into the wind in order to get anywhere in a sailboat. And so what happens when you've taken a wrong tack? You've got to adjust so you can get the wind beneath your wings. Getting the wind beneath your wings and running a sports team is an interesting concept. It means that you've got to get the momentum going and then you've got to start the ball going in the same direction like a sailboat and then you've got to withstand moments where you are off course. You've got to get yourself back on course. Changing your tack doesn't mean you're changing your destination. And when teams change their destinations, that's what they're doing by firing their coaches, by giving the players the power. You're gonna tell me, no, the destination is the Super Bowl. No, the destination is the continuity. The destination is seeing a plan through so you can evaluate whether or not your player personnel people are good, whether your coach is good. One of the things Coca is asking me right now as I'm talking, wanting to know if I would have been a different president if instead of winning the World Series in year zero, in year four, if I had won it later. So I won it in year four of my career, which was year two in the Marlins. And he wonders if we hadn't won it that year, would we have been different and not chased the way we did throughout the rest of my career? Great question. I've spoken to presidents about this who have not won a ring, who are on the chase for their first ring. And I've spoken to teams who are chasing for their second ring. Ask John Middleton that same question, the owner of the Philadelphia Phillies. He's chasing his first Amy and will do anything. He signed, as you know, Bryce Harper, JT. He brought in Trey Turner this offseason, brings in Wheeler, signs Noel, et cetera, et cetera. Wants the ring. But as I've told you, getting the first ring, there's nothing like your first, but it makes you want your second even more. So it doesn't matter if we had never won, like Bud Selig never won a World Series, and he would always talk to me you know, unhappily about the fact that we won a World Series, and he would say, I just wanted to feel it. And I would have been good just one time. Well, those are the words that are said by people who feel it never. For the people who feel it one time, they say, the way I felt it, I wanna feel it again because it'll be different. And that's what I always said. I'm gonna stop and smell the roses more. I'm gonna enjoy the moment more. I'm gonna be more present. Just give me an opportunity to feel it again. It is one of the great cruelties of our brain, isn't it? Always wanting what we don't have, always needing what we can't get. It's why everybody says you want total inner peace, right? The way to do it is to want what you have and have what you want. That is something to strive for, but do you do that? Does anyone actually do that? Anyone who has an ego, anyone who has drive, anyone who has any level of persistence, anyone who has any sense of wanting to accomplish, you're never satisfied. What do you think that Lin-Manuel Miranda came up with the concept about being satisfied or was Alexander Hamilton? Forget it. It's as common as the sunrise happening in the East. We make fun of people who don't have the drive. You're satisfied with mediocrity? That is something that I will never stand. I want to fail. What's the great quote from one of my favorite movies, Elizabethtown? No true fiasco started as a quest for mere adequacy. Think about that. No true fiasco started as a quest for mere adequacy. I am the king of the fiasco. I have overseen more fiascos than I can count on my fingers and toes. But guess what? I never wanted to be ordinary. So if I had won the World Series not till year eight versus year two versus year four, my drive was always the same. It just, I wanted the second after I got the first. I never strive for mere adequacy. That is for damn sure.
You know, things happen during the course of a season that you have to deal with. That's just a fact. You have to be prepared for issues. While you may publicly say there's no playbook, you have to think about these things when they're president of a team or when you are the owner of a team or when you are the commissioner of a league. It is a nightmare what took place last Monday with DeMar Hamlin. Absolute nightmare. But there is a responsibility for people to spring into action, not to be the ones who are on their knees praying and crying, but to be the ones making decisions about what's gonna happen now. It has only been eight days. Damar Hamlin is back in a Buffalo hospital, released from the Cincinnati hospital, moved to a Buffalo hospital. His recovery continues to be miraculous and wonderful and just a great story. But the National Football League and Roger Goodell are the authors of the biggest crock of crap that's going right now. They are stepping over each other to deny the truth about what happened that night. There are articles coming out now, because that's what happens. Once you know the player's gonna be okay, or at least gonna live, you can then start digging what exactly happened that night. Who was doing what, when, and where? Who was deciding whether or not the game was gonna be postponed? Who was deciding about that big five minutes? You have five minutes to warm up, let's get out there and play. Who's deciding whether or not Skip Bayless gets to keep working? All these things are happening right now. And we're learning that ESPN and the NFL are not on the same page. Joe Buck, who I've known for a decade and a half, two decades, he puts the C in credibility. If Joe Buck is telling you on the air that he was told that there are five minutes of warm up and then we're going back to play, he didn't make it up. The NFL is trying to make sure that everyone knows that that didn't come from anyone. There was never a thought of doing anything except canceling the game. But now they're getting firsthand accounts from people. They're beginning to talk. They're beginning to get sources. The media is not gonna let it drop because the media wants to know, thinking that you wanna know, what was Roger Goodell doing that night? What was Troy Vincent doing that night? What was going on in the quote unquote war room? The communication was happening with Dawn Aponte, who is the chief football administrator. She's a lower level employee in the NFL. Remember I told you in MLB, we've got people on duty all the time, like doctors 24 seven. Dawn was on duty that night. She's communicating to people at the field. Troy Vincent, who's the EVP of football operations, the former player is now working in the commissioner's office. Think of like Chris Young, the now GM of the Rangers who was in the commissioner's office, but used to be a player. Raul Abanez is in the commissioner's office, used to be a player. When you are a player in the commissioner's office, you are in the commissioner's office. You are not in the player union. You are not representing the players. You are representing the owners. The danger of putting a player in the commissioner's office is that they will still think like a player. The benefit is that you get to say to the current players, hey, we've got one of you amongst us. We should have total credibility because when a player is telling you something as a current player, a former player, they know what it's about. They understand the difficulties of your life as a player. So when we tell you about a rule change or about something that we're doing, trust us, we have your best interests in mind. Every player employed by a commissioner's office is there to be used, period. Not because they're qualified over anyone else, it's because they are qualified to speak to the existing players, to get done what owners and commissioners want done. Doesn't mean they're not smart, doesn't mean they're not good, doesn't mean they're not deserving, but let's not mince words about why they're there. Troy Vincent now is learning exactly what it means to be a player working in the commissioner's office because he is being put out to pasture by Roger Goodell in a shameful move. Roger, you're not gonna comment. You're having your spokespeople not comment on this issue. You're letting it out there. You're okay with it out there that Troy Vincent was the one, that he was the one in charge, that he was the one not taking control, that he was the one unsure of whether or not the game would continue, that it was the players who were saying they wouldn't play, not the league saying you shouldn't play. Where are you, Roger? Because I know you were involved. Troy Vincent is not tying his shoes without speaking to you or getting permission from you about what the next move is. Your job as commissioner 
is to own it on days like this. You know you've got the votes from your owners that you're not getting kicked out. You know that you run the comp committee. You know very well that your position is secure. Why is it so important that you make the media and the public believe that in your tower, you do not bear responsibility for what happened last Monday? Why not stand up and own it? Stand up and say, we really wanted to get that game in. We had to take the temperature of the players, but we were not going to postpone it until we were sure that the players really wouldn't play. You think Rob Manford wanted to take the All-Star game out of Atlanta? Remember that whole thing? The players, he took it out of Atlanta because the players said, we're not going to Atlanta. We're not playing there. If the players got to Troy Vincent and Roger Goodell and said, we are not playing, he's then going to say, you got to play. Play. What's the optics of that? Uh Uh-oh. We're on the wrong side of optics. All right, we're postponing. My view from the beginning has been the minute there is CPR, the game is postponed. That's an easy rule. And if it had been so easy for Roger Goodell and the NFL, the announcement would have come sooner. And don't tell me that ESPN for 40 minutes had the wrong information. Because here's another surprise for you, folks. We listen to the national broadcasts. We're listening for mistakes so they can be corrected. When they're saying there's five minutes of warm-up left, if we know that's not the case, we are getting to the booth because, shock alert, we have a direct line to the booth. (gasps) No way. We can reach the booth during a game? Do we have to scurry up the elevator or walk in? Hey, Joe, hey, it's Dave. Um, Don't say that they have five minutes anymore because I don't think we're going to play. No! We've got a phone. It is so easy to get the right information to your broadcaster, which means if they've got the information wrong, you cure it. And if it's not wrong, you don't cure it. And if you haven't cured it, guess what? It wasn't wrong. A plus B is C. A squared plus B squared equals C squared. I don't know about AQ plus B cubed equaling C cubed. I'm going to have to ask somebody. Coca, is AQ plus B cubed equals C cubed? The reason I'm worked up about this issue is I don't want to see Troy Vincent put out to pasture. I want to see accountability. I want to see the focus being taken away from what went on that Monday night. Just own it. I've been in this position where I had to make decisions after an actual death of a player. I didn't get them all right. I met the media every day for days after that death in 2016, only six years ago, and I acknowledged, hey, I did the best I could. I had the following 10 decisions to make and I tried to do them in order. I can't tell you about a funeral. I'm still trying to figure out what we're doing about today's game or tomorrow's game. I'm trying to figure out about jerseys, about honors, about routes of a casket. Give me time. Well, what are you gonna do? Are you gonna retire his number? Are you gonna honor him? I don't know. It's okay to tell people you don't know. It's okay to tell people you didn't get something right. I look for that in employees all the time. I I am just this kind of boss. I'll ask a question of an employee and I'll know they don't know the answer because I want to make sure that that employee will tell me that they don't know the answer. How many times do employees give you an answer that you know is wrong? And if they just said they didn't know, you'd be fine. How many times I don't know something when our owner would ask? Just say, I don't know. I'll get it for you. I'll check. I was wrong. There's going to be a lot of situations here because you've got Sean McDermott, the coach of the Bills. You've got Zach Taylor, the coach of the Bengals. And their credibility is being impugned and you don't want that to happen. If I'm the owner of one of those two teams, I want it to be clear that my coaches did the right thing. They were not going to play. They were taking the temperature of the players. They did not care what the NFL was doing. They were saying no play. It's interesting to see what Goodell will do going forward and whether or not they will stay silent because here's what's going to happen. There is going to be more digging on this issue. There's going to be more sources you're going to read about. There's going to be a timeline put together because this is a story of national interest, not just sports. And Roger Goodell, who has just, you know, 13 months, 14 months left in his contract, He's in a contract drive for an extension right now. He's fighting with Jerry Jones about whether or not he's going to get paid more, which he thinks he deserves. 
Roger Goodell has till right now to take charge of this story again, take the microphone, take us through what happened and acknowledge, because we'll forgive you because it's stressful and difficult when you've got a player on the field. Take control. That's your job. Willie, wait to see. All right, we come back, we're gonna review a movie that I'd like to see get some Oscar love as we head into the Golden Globes tonight, which I'm quite excited about. And then we are going to talk about my pick of the day. I think Georgia did not cover last night, but we're gonna get back to it. We'll be right back. Welcome back to Nothing Personal. It's David Sampson. Thank you, by the way. Tell your friends about Nothing Personal. Tell them that we're live Monday, Wednesdays, and Fridays at 8 a.m. on YouTube. Just subscribe, please. Tuesday, Thursday, of course, we're still doing shows five days a week. We're coming to you every day. Rate, review, subscribe, because we want you to. So thank you. So it is the best time of year for movies, best time of year. I watched Decision to Leave. Decision to Leave is in Korean. Decision to Leave is about a relationship between the wife of a victim of a crime, is it a crime? And the police officer who is investigating the crime. It is a brilliant movie. And not brilliant because it's in subtitles. And by definition, when something's in subtitles, it has this aura of gravitas. Oh, this must be good. It's in subtitles. No, you can have totally crappy movies that have subtitles. The way that this film is shot, the scenes and the building of the crescendo as you wonder what's happening in the relationship between this woman and this police officer, what will happen in this relationship there's something amazing in movies about the forbidden fruit, right? If you can write a movie where you pretty much know what the end is, like any romantic comedy, right? You know they're going to end up together. But when there's some sort of switch that deviates away from what you know, or the course to get to where you think you know it's going is different than what you th thought or expected, that creates this great affinity for that writer, for that movie, right? You have great respect because, wow, you surprised me. Decision to leave is two hours of surprises. You think it's gonna be your standard run of the mill, cop falls in love with victim, victim falls in love with cop, cop was involved in crime because cop wanted to be with victim's wife. I've seen that one before. You have not seen Decision to Leave before. Not any part of it. Thank you to the brilliance of the filmmakers. I believe this should be nominated and the nominations come out the 24th uh, for the Oscars. That's a big day, by the way. The 24th, in addition to be my sister's birthday, that is the day that the Academy Award nominations come out. I think it's also the day that the Hall of Fame announces its ballot in Major League Baseball. We have a lot to do that day. All right, Coca. Play me some music. You know what I want? <laughs> I want to talk to Samson. So you want to talk to Samson. Get to me on Twitter at David P. Samson. Hit follow, ask me questions. Hello, David. Bernie Kozar lost his pre-game radio programming gig by outwardly placing the first ever legal bet in Ohio for $19,000. Winnings were to go to a charity. He lost that bet too. Since he was so open about it, if you were team president, would you have spoken to him before the bet was made? Bernie was taken completely by surprise, according to the article I read. Bernie Kosar is the former quarterback for the Cleveland Browns, well-known quarterback. I think everybody's heard of him. If you haven't, you should have. His post-playing career has been interesting. Front office of team, trying to get it all together, trying to figure it all out. I get it. He was doing radio for Cleveland. And he made it public that he was betting 19,000 on Cleveland against Pittsburgh. Word got out because he let it get out because he told you he was doing it. And he violated his contract, which said you can't bet on Cleveland. So he, they fired him. The question is that you're asking is what would I do? Here's the answer. We have a real problem with gambling, much more so than we had 
when I was running a team. The reason it's bigger is that gambling has now been embraced by football. It's been embraced by baseball. It is a huge source of revenue, whether it's DraftKings or FanDuel or BetMGM, all the different sites are pouring money into teams. The commissioner's office on one hand has to keep the competitive integrity going on the other hand, has to make it okay for people to gamble because that's what the companies want. Make no mistake, the companies who are putting commercials on TV, there's a Super Bowl commercial of Gronk trying to kick a field goal sponsored by FanDuel, I think, live during the Super Bowl. Why are they doing that? So you bet all the different ways and all the different things, bet $1, win $100, bet a dollar, get a dollar back, lose $5, get $5 back, it's all done. For the same reason, salt is put on food coming out of the kitchen. It makes you want more. It makes you want to drink more and eat more. You get addicted. I am all for what's going on on the gambling side. People are going to gamble. I'd rather these companies get it than bookies. I'd rather legal companies get it than online illegal islands where you've got SBF running to some company out of the Cayman Islands. I'm happy everything's above board. But if you are going to embrace an industry, then you've got to understand what that means. You've got to understand the ripple effect. The ripple effect is executives bet, players bet. I don't know about Pete Rose, right? Gambling on your own team when you're the manager, gambling against your team, gambling for your team. Maybe the only rule is you want to bet on football when you're in football, just don't bet on the game you're doing. Maybe the rule is when you're calling a game, don't bet on the game you're calling. We've got to make a rule, and then we've just got to stick to it. Do you think that Bernie Kosar has inside information about Cleveland? You're damn right he does. If there's inside information that someone possesses, that's what you have to stop. That is illegal when you're trading stocks, which is gambling. There's an entire organization in the government called the SEC. Their entire job is to make sure that with your inside information, you're not using it to gain an advantage over the general public. It's the same with gambling. We need an SEC for gambling. And baseball and football and basketball better get their act together and get some sort of governing body. Washington, you better be listening. All of you who are anti-government, I don't care. We need anti-big government, I should say. We need an organization that is there for the sole reason to ensure the integrity of our games on the field because gambling is happening. You want to enforce a rule, the only rule should be no inside information used. Now, keep in mind, when you are running company X, you often have inside information about company Y, even in a different industry. So the rule is anything that looks off gets investigated. If you're the CEO of a company that makes cars, but you put a lot of money in a company that's making pavement, why are you doing that? Do you know something that other people don't know? When you are a football broadcaster, do you know something about a Major League Baseball game that you only know because you're a famous football broadcaster? Or are you the same as the other schnook on the corner who's just saying, oh, I like that starting pitcher. I'm putting it through my calculus. I've got a computer program and that's why I'm betting. There are organizations that will have to be made and developed and funded and staffed who can tell the difference. I would say to my employees something very simple. You want to be the safest you can be? Don't gamble at all. Much like if you are the president of a company or chairman of a publicly traded company, isn't it smart to not invest in other companies at all? Put your money in a blind trust where you have no say, wink, wink, like all the presidents do when they come become president. Oh, our money's in a trust. We have nothing to do with it. We have no idea. It's the biggest bunch of horse hockey ever, but it sounds good. I'm putting all my money in a trust and whatever trades they're doing, they're doing on their own. There's a huge wall in between. I don't even get statements anymore. You could say that with gambling. You could say, hey, I don't bet at all, but would it be very hard to get your friend to bet? I don't have an account. Oh, but this guy does on my behalf. And then he brings me cash in a parking lot. There are a million ways that people try to get around the system and a million ways that people try to commit crimes and a million ways people try to make money. That is why you have the police. That's why you have the FBI. That's why you have the SEC. 
because we are trying, they are trying to make sure that it's a level playing field. But don't worry, Bernie did it for charity. NTP, not the point. You think that he just gambles for charity or does he place bets not for charity, for himself? Or does he have other people place bets based on information he knows? There's only one way that you can discern the difference. Make a rule, don't bet. When you've got that rule that you can't bet, if you're caught betting, you're fired. It's that simple. Would I have stopped him from making the bet? You're damn right I would have, because I don't want him fired. He's an ambassador to the community. But I know that once he goes public and once he does it, I have no choice. Forget the fact that he didn't win. He simply has no choice. Zero and six. I had, there was a mistake in yesterday's show, Coco, and because we were live, I understand why you made the mistake, but as producer, you gotta catch this. I had said that my pick was TCU plus 58 and a half. I had gotten this special teaser as a promotion from a betting site. So I thought I told you that the line was 58 and a half. So I'm not willing to take a loss on George's win, 65 to seven last night. I believe I covered by half a point. So I'm gonna tell you that I am taking this loss, but under protest. I'd like you to give a ruling by tomorrow, but until then I'm zero and six as TCU laid an egg that smelled rancid. Horrific. Georgia, the dynasty. Is Vince Dooley still a the coach there or is it Kirby Smart? I don't care who it is because we lost. First team to repeat since Alabama 10 years ago. Good for Georgia. Everyone's right. Say, Isn't it amazing? They don't even let them celebrate for one minute. Hey, what do you think about the three-peat? That drives me crazy. All right, pick of the day today. Eventually, we're going to win. I mean, you want to fade Samson right now? You can do it. But I'm telling you, I'm going to give an extra wait to see here, Coca. We are 0-6. Wait to see. We will finish this year in the black. We're going to be above 500 in picks, and we're going to be up money. Wait to see. It's just been a very tough start. Cavs, three and a half over the Jazz in Utah. Total sucker bet. Utah was so good in the beginning, they're back to being Utah. I don't know if Donovan Mitchell's playing. I hope so. If they're favored by three and a half in Utah, I better be playing. Cavs, three and a half over the Jazz in Utah. Can't wait to get to the NFL so I can give you picks for the weekend. I'm going to get back to 500 this weekend alone. I woke up this morning with a bit of a headache. Didn't sleep well last night. Didn't expect I would get the news that I got. I've not been sleeping well at all. I can't figure out what's going on with me pressure, tension, anxiety, all of the above. I don't know if you notice when the shows are live that I feel a little bit more sweaty or a little bit more concerned, even though right now we might as well be live because if I make a mistake, I make a mistake. But I did not open my eyes this morning expecting to read that Carlos Correa may be going to the Twins. Let me remind you that Carlos Correa is Scott Boris's shortstop who played with the Twins last year because he couldn't get a long-term deal because of injuries and lack of playing. He signed a three-year deal with the Twins, but it was really a one-year deal. Carlos Correa has a decent year. The Twins don't. He opts out, becomes a free agent. He signs with the San Francisco Giants, fails the physical. Uh Uh-oh. Immediately signs with the Mets. Great news. Stephen Cohn from Hawaii sipping on some sort of fruit cocktail says, hey, this is the difference maker. Thank God we've got him. 315 million down from 350, no problem. Boris says, we'll take it. That was like 16 days ago. The reason the Mets haven't signed him is they're not happy with his physical either. And Scott Boris does not want to renegotiate the deal, but he's going to have to. But now he's desperate. So Scott Boris is calling up other teams saying, hey, you want Carlos? Come on, he's, he's free. He's available. Just give him 12 years, $305 million. You can have him. The Minnesota Twins were rumored to have offered him 10 years, 285. Hear me now and listen to me later. The Minnesota Twins will not sign Carlos Correa to a 10-year, $285 million deal. They're not that stupid. The New York Mets can afford to be wrong. They can afford to have Carlos Correa hurt and not play. They can afford to sign a $300 million player who doesn't perform. Team doesn't win. The Minnesota Twins, no way. No way. Is it possible that I've been right the whole time that Major League Baseball got themselves involved and said, Steve Cohn, you're not signing him to that deal. 
Then he goes to Minnesota. Guess what? If he goes to Minnesota, he's going back for a shorter deal. Proving health still, having a third year of 135 plus games. Minnesota cannot make a mistake. A three-year deal, no problem. 60 million a year for three years. Double Bauer, one and a half Scherzer, whatever, no problem. But a 10-year deal at 28 a year or 27 a year or 26 a year, no. There has to be a way to negotiate where both sides are gonna be happy. How does Scott Boris make Carlos Correa happy when he's promised him year after year that he was gonna get the career contract? Scott Boris has not underestimated the market. He has not done anything other than what he always does, which is tell his players that he will get them the long-term deal because history says he always gets the long-term deal for the players. He always finds one owner to cave. If I'm a player or the parent of a player, I want Scott Boris as my agent because somehow he has pictures of owners with goats. But not the poll ads. The poll ads are not going to bail out Scott this time. Watch it. Now, how do the Mets save face here? I got an idea. And here's what it is. The guarantee is going to go down from 315 to below 275. The years are going to go down to about a decade. The incentives are going to go up. If I'm Scott Boris and I want to save face, the only way to do it is to guarantee fewer dollars, but to give Correa a chance to make more because than he would have under the original deal. And as a Met, as Steve Cohn, I'm good with that. If he plays and performs, gets at bats during the course of a season, vests into another year, gets escalators for number of games played, and that escalation brings him to the Giants level. Think about this for one second if you're Scott Boris. I've got a problem because I thought my player was getting 350 from the Giants. Now he's only getting 315 from the Mets, but they won't even give him 315. I'm gonna convince him to take 270 so the Mets can say they're satisfied, but I'm gonna give him a chance to make 370. So I have a chance to tell the player, hey, you have a chance to make even more. All you gotta do is stay healthy and you say you're healthy, be healthy. I think that's the type of compromise that's gonna be worked out, but it's not gonna be with the twins. Here's how this goes. Carlos Correa is going to be a New York Met. Carlos Correa, I have a wait to see from November 7th of 2022. I already took the loss on it. Wait to see is when I tell you something's gonna happen. If it happens, I revisit it. If it doesn't happen, I revisit it. I took the loss because I said Correa will sign for under 275. And he signed for more with the Mets and the Giants. So I acknowledge the loss. Forget it. I'm taking it back. I'm not taking the loss on that. That is still an open wait to see. And I think I'm going to win that wait to see because I think at the end of the day, he's going to sign for under 275. So wait to see on the wait to see. How great is that? Now, what about timing of this? Article is coming out that the twins are close. Does that get the Mets going? I think Steve Cohn gets a call from Billy Epler. Hey, we may lose him. Steve Cohn knows better. He knows. He's talking to the commissioner's office. The twins are talking to the commissioner's office. They're all talking to their doctors. They're all talking to Boris. They're all realizing that spring training is still over a month away. There's no tremendous rush. I think Boris is too soon on these leaks about how close the twins are. Too panicked. He comes off a little too panicked. Keep calm, Scott. You're going to get your wish. Owners always give in to you. Just be creative. You above all, you're aware. It's just business. You're going to have to call Carlos Correa at one point and say, this is nothing personal.